Stop 8, Introduction. Welcome to Mostly Biblical, New Etchings by Zevi Bloom, an exhibition following Mr. Bloom's full and diverse career in the fields of architecture, industrial design, teaching, and studio art. This body of work encapsulates the allure and curiosity Bloom carries for the Old Testament, which, quote, provided him in some mysterious way with his very foundation, but has been a puzzlement to him, unquote. In the artist's essay accompanying this series, titled Aesthetic Talmudist, he infers that the Bible serves all who follow it in the same way fairy tales serve as children. We retell these stories for their moral nourishment and a grounding sense of identity. Yet Bloom revisits these narratives with parody, a consistent theme in his work, to highlight the ambiguities readers may overlook. Through embellished form and exorbitant line, Bloom, like many traditional satirists before him, investigates the oddities dwelling within this religious text with subtle wit. Bloom's intent is not to offend, but to be in service of the mind and make his audience aware of the sagas and players of, quote, biblical episodes that have haunted him since childhood, unquote. Stop 9. Samson's Columns. Bloom's etchings are not testimonials of fact, but suggestions drawn from memory, our selective recording device that guides the human experience. For example, here Bloom's memory illustrates Samson, legendary Israelite hero whom he idolized growing up during one of Samson's few inglorious moments. The scene depicts Samson with his long, unshorn hair, from which he derives his God-given superhuman strength, found between two luxuriously rendered Corinthian columns. The last to his left could be Delilah, the temptress who seduced and tricked Samson leading to his capture, or it might just be a happy Philistine. The tale comes from the Book of Judges and concludes when Samson meets his own end by collapsing the columns unto himself and the enemy crowd. No classic fairy tale ending here. A hero who betrays his god, succumbs to temptation in a moment of weakness, and in a final attempt to redeem himself, takes his own life. Bloom's choice reflects a critical stroll through childhood memories of a hero companion. Why not depict Samson slaying lions with his bare hands, or killing 1,000 Philistine warriors? Yet the title gives ownership to Samson as if the columns of his enemy's temple, emblems of power and structure, belong to him, rather than about to spell his demise. This depiction of Samson shows the artist's childhood hero from a decidedly mature perspective. We see both the foible and power of Samson. Stop 10. Manichaean Tableau Manichaean, as defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, comes from late Greek Manichaeus Manes, the Persian founder of Manichaeism, a syncretistic religious dualism which spread throughout the Roman Empire all the way to China. This philosophical dualism taught that good and evil, light and dark matter, were constant influences battling it out within the human soul. The stage before you, framed by folds of curtains, summarizes the relationship between Manichaeism and its religious competitors. All believers in a singular, omnipotent deity found Manichaeism threatening. In the left register floats Moses, with Death Stare, the Ten Commandment tablets, and a band of trumpeting angels all beneath an archway, a symbol of Western world achievement. To the right, the Manichaeans are mid-fertility ritual, which honors Mithra, their god of light, for the killing of the cosmic bull whose blood fertilized all vegetation and fueled the people. Notice the wings attached to the bull's hoods, the angel reaching for another's halo, all makings for an elaborate set upon which Bloom illustrates the divide in faith with humor. Stop 11. Isaac's Great Escape Isaac, son of Abraham and Sarah, 
was the founding patriarch of the Israelites. His story begins with terror, when God demanded that Abraham sacrifice six-year-old Isaac in the land of Moriah. Isaac sensed the danger on their trip up the mountain, but in the nick of time, an angel stalled Abraham's knife and ordered him to sacrifice the ram grazing nearby instead. Isaac is mentioned in numerous religious texts, including the book of Genesis, the Quran, and the New Testament, but in no script does it address the trauma Isaac incurred, whether or not Abraham consulted Sarah on the matter, or question why would God ever ask Abraham to sacrifice his own son. Ironically, Isaac did not escape. He was saved. Bloom renders fright with comic relief in the ram's large, curly horns amidst the humorously plump vegetation of Moria and the angel's electric hairdo, all cues of a classic Bloom parody. Stop 12. Dreaming with Jacob. Jacob, the third patriarch of the Israelites, son of Isaac and Rebekah, was en route to Haran when he envisioned a ladder coming down from the heavens with angels hanging on every rung and the voice of God bellowing from the sky. The angels represented the number of years in exile the Jewish people would have to live through. God promised Jacob that surely all the angels would, quote, fall from the ladder, signifying the end of their days in expulsion and return to the Holy Land. Dreaming with Jacob implies that Bloom shares in Jacob's optimistic vision but he accepts it as a dream, not a reality. Bloom shares that he, quote, grew up in a highly cultured, if non-observant, Jewish family. He studied architecture at the University of Cornell, where he went on to teach and become the chairman of the fine art department. Then, after seven biblical years as an architect, he entered the art field. Stop 13. Biblical Conflict Resolution, the 24. From the book of Samuel, after the death of King Saul, the Philistine kingdom split in two, naming Saul's son David as the king of Judah and Ishbosheth king of Israel. To avoid civil war, the army's generals, Job and Abner, respectively, thought it wise to match their 12 best warriors against each other in friendly combat to declare a dominant army. Again, Bloom creates a satire of this event in the irony of his title. For the battle ends not with resolution, but with all 24 men dead and a civil war pending. Bloom's work tends to both illuminate and utilize the visual material left in history's many forgotten tales. He shares with us that once he dedicated a show to the lives of saints upon learning that almost no one knew why St. Nicholas was the patron saint of children. His investigation into this area revealed a lush and extravagant imagery that he, quote, never could have invented. Stop 14. Renaissance and Quattro Centro Pursuits and Concerns. Bloom strays from the biblical to acknowledge and delight in the accomplishments in perspective and the artistic concerns of the Renaissance. This piece references Carlo Crivelli's Annunciation with St. Amadeus from 1486. To depict the peacock, an exotic bird imported from China, was an opportunity to prove one's artistic skill, and Bloom's rendition is perched sweetly atop the archway over Mary's aha moment. Referencing icons in a field's past is a common practice for any artist, writer, filmmaker, etc. The ability to transfer such pursuits to etching is a process nearly as complicated as drafting an architectural blueprint. The etching process consists of a metal plate primed with a waxy resistant ground onto which the artist uses a sharp pen-shaped tool to engrave lines, scraping away the wax resist and exposing the metal surface. Bloom's lines are many and often connected to one another to make a lavishly complex composition. The metal plate is then bathed in an acid wash, which deepens the engraved lines. The plate is inked all over and wiped clean, so the ink remains only in the carved line. To make a print, 
A piece of moist or softened paper is placed over the inked plate and together run through a high pressure printing press. The paper absorbs the inked lines and this process can be repeated to create several prints from one plate. Bloom's final touch is adding layers of watercolor to create a unique one-of-a-kind addition. Stop 15, Jephthah's Daughter. The unfortunate story of Jephthah and his daughter comes from the Book of Judges, where Jephthah, a member of the tribe of Manasseh, promises to defeat the Ammonite enemies and lead his people back into God's favor. This victory will reward Jephthah with the status as chieftain of the Manasseans. To ensure victory, Jephthah makes a vow. He says, quote, Whatever or whoever emerges and comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be God's, and I shall sacrifice him, her, or it as a holocaust. From the Judges 11.31 Who emerges but his only child, a daughter? Her name never actually appears in the text, but her death stirred much controversy centuries later among Bible scholars. At the conclusion of Blum's catalog essay, the artist sheds his own light on such confusing and consistent themes, playing out time and again in our, quote, collective history. He says, quote, It is evident that my God is a warrior God, and as such he provided his people with plenty of wars. Ironically, the Israelites proved to be the first Spartans. The people of and in the book in their narrative with God, seem oddly lacking in spiritual qualities. Prophets were required time and time again to put things right. To what avail is a religious text if it does not employ mysterious and ambiguous, as well as endless sustaining metaphors in its service? These come in parables, sentences, and solitary words. For as long as anyone can remember, they have been escorted by uniformed God professionals to explain their meaning in every nuance. Who could possibly assume to completely understand a deity without succeeding in their own apotheosis? Kavit Lecter, unquote. 